everybody who has used Linux before or who knows the terminal on macOS knows about sudo. Sudo is a small tool that allows you to run commands as root if you are allowed to do so. But unknowingly to the world in 2011, a critical bug was introduced into sudo that could be exploited by any user to gain root privileges. This bug was hidden until about 10 years later when it was found by a security researcher team from Qualys. They found a heap-based buffer overflow in sudo. It's tracked under CVE 2021-3156 and they named it Baron Same Edit. Though I want to rename it to Pwn Edit because that's much better. In this video, I want to share the lessons I have learned from this bug and give you the most comprehensive summary about it. We will talk about the discovery, analysis and eventually exploitation. This bug seems surprisingly simple. Just write sudo edit minus s, some characters and end with a backslash. Boom, that's it. Heap overflow triggered. I think what many people thought when they saw this was, how was this missed for almost 10 years? Shouldn't any fuzzer find this very quickly? Especially with easy to use fuzzers like AFL, American Fuzzy Lob. I imagine many people must have fuzzed every Linux binary there is, especially the critical ones like sudo. But it turns out that there are just tons of obstacles you have to overcome. And I learned this the hard way by trying to rediscover the bug using AFL. It already starts with the fact that AFL is intended to fuzz file parsing. So AFL wants to fuzz a target binary that reads data from standard input or a file name passed as an argument. So it can't easily fuzz arguments itself. In order to make that possible, you need to make modifications. And actually there is an experimental argv fuzz inline header file in the AFL repository. You basically add this macro at the start of main and this function then reads data from standard input and will craft a fake argument array, a fake argv array based on this data. Then it overrides the real argv. Now any code coming afterwards that wants to access the arguments uses the fake data. And now you have a pseudo binary that you can give arguments as null byte separated list to standard input which means AFL can theoretically fuzz the sudo arguments. Are you sure? Maybe? It turns out if you try to instrument sudo with AFL, the resulting binary just crashes. It doesn't work. Luckily, I read on a blog by Milex7 that using the Clang instrumentation instead works. Fine. Now you can fuzz it. But that's not the end of your problems. Actually, the experimental argv fuzzing code from AFL contains a buffer overflow. There's no limit on how high the RC index can count and the array it's indexing has a limited size. So the first crashes you will find are because this code is bad. What a great start. Just FYI, the actively maintained fork of AFL called AFL++ has none of these issues. The instrumentation works and the argv wrapper also got fixed. So if you want to try out AFL, I recommend to go straight to AFL++. But cool, so now we can fast sudo and find this bug, right? Not so fast. In order to find the sudo edit bug, one has to know that sudo edit is part of sudo. In fact, it's a symlink to the binary. When you execute the symlink, argv0, so the first argument passed to the program will be the file name of the symlink, so sudo edit. And inside sudo source code, there is a check with this program name. And if it ends with edit, it will have different functionality. So when you are going to fast sudo, you need to be aware of this. If you would think, let's just fuzz the pseudo binary and start fuzzing the normal arguments, you would never find it. But even if your fuzzer would be generic enough and also fuzz the first argument argv0, then it would still not work. Because actually sudo uses different ways to get the program name, not from argv0, but from getprogname if available. So you specifically have to remove this part from the source in order for it to always fall back to argv0 for the program name. Or you need to specifically fuss with the binary named sudo edit. For example, the argv wrapper from AFL did not include argv0 by default. You would have to adjust the RC index start value, but the AFL++ version starts at zero by default. You think that would be everything we need to fuss sudo? Well, no. Sudo is a special binary. It works thanks to the concept of setUID. This execution flag s indicates that when executed, it will run as root. But that is only half accurate. A Linux process knows two different user IDs, the real user ID and the effective user ID. 
If you as a regular user with user ID 1000 execute a normal program, the process will run with the user ID and effective UID of 1000. If the root user executes a normal program, the process will run with the regular user ID and effective UID of zero. But when a regular user executes a set UID binary like sudo, it will actually still have the user ID 1000, but the effective UID is zero. And now we come to the problem fuzzing this. Of course, it depends on how you fuzz, but for example, in the case of the typical fuzzer AFL, you need higher privileges to interact with the said UID running process. Eh, life overflow from weeks in the future here. When I did this original research, I thought I tested fuzzing with the proper set UID bit on the binary while being an unprivileged user, and that failed. But I just tried to record the footage of that error, and I noticed it seems to work. So at the time, I must have ran into some weird other issue that I misinterpreted. Hmm. Though, what user you use to fast sudo is still a consideration you have to think about. And I will tell you now the struggles I had when trying to fast sudo already being root. So you might have to run the fuzzer as a root. But this means you are already root and then sudo behaves very differently. That's very bad for fuzzing. For example, sudo edit launches the vim editor if you are already root and then fuzzing causes thousands of vim processes to be launched and you will have a bad time. And that wouldn't happen if you were a regular user. Those code paths would not be reachable. So when I tried to fuzz it, I solved this by modifying the code. I hard-coded the return value of the calls to get UID and get group ID to be the unprivileged user ID. Now running sudo as the root user behaves as if you were the regular user. Now you can finally start fuzzing. And yes, if you overcame all these obstacles, then fuzzing would have found this vulnerability. So what I learned is, even though it looks simple and should be easily found through fuzzing, in practice, there are just too many challenges to overcome. So it's no surprise to me that nobody fussed sudo this way before. But that begs the question, how did the researcher team at Qualys find this bug? Well, they didn't use fuzzing. In an interview on Paul Security Weekly, they mentioned that they did manual code review. They just read the sudo source code and found this bug. I've actually written the researchers an email and asked them a few curious questions about this and they told me a little bit about their process. When we audit code, we completely open our mind. Anything that differs from the program's or programmer's expectation is interesting or may become interesting at some point. So any kind of bug and weirdness is worth looking into. And this process clearly shows when we look at the steps that led to the discovery of the bug. It all started with finding the loop in set command which might increment a pointer out of bounds. If we just isolate this code and assume an attacker fully controls the data coming into this function, then this is actually an insecure function. You see, new argv is basically the data coming in. It's an array of pointers to strings, basically a string array, and it will go through each string in that list and sums up the length of it, and then allocates the user args buffer on the heap. That is the buffer that will be vulnerable to the overflow. And now we keep copying character by character the strings into the target user args buffer. Two is user args and the from pointer is coming from av, which is coming from the new argv array. So it goes through an array of strings and creates a long concatenated string. And all is fine, except this check for the backslash. Because when this if condition is true, then we move the from pointer one character forward. We basically ignore the backslash, copy the next character for sure, and move forward again. Strings in C in memory are null terminated. They stop at a null. And this while loop basically copies until there is a null byte in the from string. But if a backslash is at the end of the string before the null byte, then we copy the null byte and move the pointer forward. Now pointing into unrelated data coming after the string. And we keep copying that until we hit another null byte. And now the string length calculation and the actual data being copied doesn't match anymore. And now we have a buffer overflow. I know this code is not pretty, but somebody who is experienced reading C code should be able to identify the problem in this code quickly. But this code is obviously not coming in isolation. And it turns out when you look at where this data is coming from, it passes through the function parse args specifically this section here. For shell mode, we need to rewrite argv. And here it is adding backslashes to special characters. 
So theoretically, if you provide an argument ending with a special character like a backslash, then this code will escape the backslash. So add another one. And now set command works safely. You don't have a single backslash in front of the terminating null byte anymore. But it's still curious that you have this function that has to trust the other function. And so the researchers were checking if there are any bypasses. Maybe there is a way to reach the second function without going through the parse argx argv rewrite first. And sudo turns out to have a lot of different mode flags. Check out this parse args function. Depending on argument flags you use, different modes are set or reset. And the argv rewrite is only triggered if you have mode run and mode shell set. While the set command code runs when this if case is passed. And you might quickly wonder, wait, that doesn't match 100%. Can you somehow get sudo into a certain mode where it does not trigger the argument rewrite but gets into the set command here? And indeed, that happens when you do sudo edit minus s. I think if you think about the code review this way, this bug almost becomes obvious and it doesn't feel as scary anymore. It almost feels like I could have found it. Anyway, now that we understand the root cause of the overflow, we can think about exploitation. And this is also very fascinating to me. On a modern system, there are a lot of exploit mitigations. There's ASLR, so address space is randomized, non-executable stack, so you can't use shellcode, and the heap implementation is also hardened. That's why you see that heap abort in the first place. The heap implementation noticed something got corrupted and bailed out. We know from experience that these exploit mitigations are not super effective, especially in larger software with more user interaction. But in the case of sudo, the exploit mitigations seem actually pretty strong. For example, defeating ASLR usually works in two steps. First, you use a bug to leak some addresses from memory, which based on that can be used to calculate all other offsets. So randomization is broken. And then knowing addresses, you can perform the actual main part of the exploit. But sudo is a one-shot exploit. You execute it with those arguments and your exploit either worked or not. So the chances for successful exploitation seem low or at least not trivial. In the advisory, they present a few ways how it could be exploited. And especially option 2 seemed just so crazy. Let me explain. If you imagine memory and there is a bad buffer that can be overflowed, then they figured out how to put the service user object right afterwards. So their overflow can overwrite the values of this object. And then later during sudo's execution, it will use Linux's name server switch NSS features, which uses values from the server user object to load a dynamic library. So it attempts to load code from an external file. And if you, of course, control what file is loaded, you can let it load malicious attacker code, resulting in arbitrary code execution inside the sudo process. When I read this, I could not comprehend how somebody would come up with this. Sudo is not a very small program, so there are a lot of objects allocated on the heap. How do you know that exactly this service user object can be overwritten to load an external library? I didn't even know about Linux's name server switch, NSS. But even if you would know it exists, how would you know that it can be used for exploitation? Is this maybe a known exploitation technique? Has this been done before? Well, I'm so glad I spent the time trying to analyze the bug myself and come up with my own exploitation strategy because now it's so clear to me how they figured that out. So the vulnerability is clear. You have a buffer on the heap that can be overflown. So you can override any other data, any other objects coming after your buffer. But how can you control what comes after your buffer? Well, you can't control that directly, but there's stuff that influences it. So during execution, different size objects are allocated and freed on the heap, leaving the heap fragmented. Depending on the size of your buffer, which you do control, here's the malloc based on a dynamic size, the malloc algorithm will place it into different holes. But not only that. By looking on the heap for other recognizable data, I saw that some environment variables, mostly LC values, so locale related, are placed on the heap as well. Which means we can control the size or even existence of a few more heap objects, which in turn affects how the heap is fragmented. So 
different lengths environment variables and different sizes of our vulnerable buffer will result in different objects allocated afterwards. The art of grooming the heap layout to be exactly how you want it to be is also beautifully called heap feng shui or heap feng shui. So what you can do is you write a script and just randomize LC environment variables and the size of the buffer to overflow and you just look at where sudo crashes. I use GDB to give me a backtrace of each crash to see in what function the crash happened. And then I made a file name from it and logged the crashes. And here you can see the result after a few hours of brute forcing. These are all segmentation faults in different functions caused by our heap overflow. And what's noticeable is that there are not infinitely many cases. You just don't have that much control over the heap allocations to freely craft the heap layout you want. There are only a few dozen crash options. And now you need to think about which overflow is most likely to be usable for an exploit. And you might already have noticed that there are a few NSS related crashes. And most notable is here the function NSS lookup function. And that sounds juicy. Maybe you overflow an object that controls what functions you load and execute. That would be perfect for exploitation. And when you start looking into the actual source code of that function, you quickly see that it calls NSS load library, which calls DL open, which sounds like a perfect target for exploitation. And that's basically how the most pseudo exploits for this vulnerability work and how my own exploit worked. It takes a bit of careful control of the service user object to pass all the if cases in the correct way, but you will be able to control the library being loaded by DL open. This was mind blowing to me because what I thought was this crazy exploit strategy that I just couldn't imagine how somebody found that turns out to be just mostly luck. It kinda is the only viable exploit option or at least easy exploit options. You should always assume by default this is exploitable, but this is the only fairly easy yet powerful exploit strategy. As I mentioned, I've written the researchers an email and they actually shared with me their environment variable brute force code. Their code was much better than my shitty Python script, but in essence, we did the same thing. We looked at curious crashes and figured out that NSS lookup function or NSS load library is a great target. Though that's only half true because it turns out that NSS load library is in fact part of a known exploit strategy they used during their stack clash research in 2017. Here they discuss interesting functions usable for return to libc, meaning they could redirect code execution to this function to load an attacker controlled shared library. This is of course different from what has been done in the pseudo exploit, but they did know that NSS related functions might result in a shared library being loaded. So seeing crashes in these functions did immediately spark their interest and they saw potential. By the way, there were also reports that the Mac version of sudo was also vulnerable, but nobody developed an exploit for it. So I decided to do a quick feasibility analysis of it. Basically, I tried to write the same fuzzer just for Mac using LLDB and so forth but I didn't get nice reproducible crashes. And it turns out that there is also a lot more randomness with the heap. Look, I execute the same payload and sometimes it crashes and sometimes not. That's not the case on Linux where running it multiple times with the exact same inputs would result in the same heap layout. So I think exploiting sudo on Mac is a lot harder and I have very little experience about exploit development on Mac anyway. But I would be very curious if anybody manages to pull that off. Maybe when you are watching this video, you might feel a bit that this is all super crazy stuff. But I can tell you that I felt the same way when I read the advisory. Keep in mind that I did spend about two weeks investigating this, intentionally forcing myself to rediscover, analyze and exploit the bug myself. And in the end, I can tell you, it doesn't seem that crazy anymore. And this video is actually the start of a new series on this channel. I documented my research into sudo, digging into all the details. It might require some prior basic exploitation knowledge, so maybe check out my binary exploitation playlist. I also linked a few other related resources below, but then you should be able to kind of follow along. And now with this video, you have seen the big picture already. Yes, it kind of is a spoiler of the whole series, but I think it will help you greatly to be able to follow along those more in-depth videos. I'm really excited about it. I think it's a very unique learning resource that doesn't really exist. So I hope you will appreciate it too. And lastly, if you want to support these kind of videos, kindly check out liveoverflow.com support. Thanks.